His disciples said to Jesus, Now you are speaking plainly and not using metaphors. Now we see that you know everything and do not have to wait for questions to be put into words. Because of this, we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you believe at last? Listen, the time will come. In fact, it has come already when you will be scattered, each going his own way and leaving me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I've told you all this so that you may find peace in me. In the world, you will have trouble, but be brave. I have conquered the world. The Gospel of the Lord. I've been away from this parish for seven years, but you all still look the same. <laughs> Take that as a compliment. You know, one of my favorite prayers to our Blessed Mother, which I believe would be yours too for many of you, is the Salve Regina. Hail, Holy Queen, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. And so in that opening salutation to Our Lady, we hail her as our hope. At the end of each day, as darkness descends, the Church confidently proclaims at the completion of a night prayer this invocation of hope, this prayer of hope, this anthem of hope directed to Our Lady. It is as if the Church wishes to remind us that Our Lady is a beacon of hope, throwing a challenge to the surrounding darkness, assuring us that no matter what burdens, anxieties and problems may weigh on our minds and our hearts during the entire day, there is a hope that a bright new day would follow after the night of confusion, that light would follow after the darkness, and an immaculate heart will triumph. Hope. Now that's a word often on our lips, right? Some people talk about it. I hope this happens in the future. A lot of people wish for it. I hope my friend gets better soon. I hope this priest leaves and this one comes. But usually few of us have it. The reason is that real hope is not something we can kind of manufacture on our own. Rather, it is a gift. And if you know something of your catechism, remember, it's one of the three theological gifts, faith, hope, and charity granted by God. In his first epistle, St. Peter confidently declares, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. For Peter, as well as all Christians, our hope lies in this, our salvation, won for us to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the hope of salvation which Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI wrote in his encyclical on hope, spes salvi. Now the Pope gives a name and a face to it. He says, Man's great true hope, which holds firm in spite of all disappointments, can only be God. God who has loved us and continues to love us till the end, until all is accomplished. This is what hope is all about. It isn't just wishful thinking or false optimism that things would get better. You remember Murphy's Law? We have no way of being certain that things would get better, but if there's some truth to Murphy's Law, things often get from bad to worse. Hope has little to do with luck, chance, or good fortune. Some of you may be standing outside the Umbak Eko shop hoping 
hoping that you will strike. Well, sometimes you strike and sometimes you don't. And sometimes you waste more money at the Empat Eco shop. Well, it also isn't wishful thinking. It's not based on the confidence that man has his own strength, his own resources and his devices. Rather, hope is ultimately a call to look beyond all our earthly hopes to that great hope of salvation. Do we hope for salvation? Do we hope one day to be in heaven? And sometimes we have to contend with the two sins against this hope. One is presumption. Many of us already think heaven is guaranteed for us. You know, we live our lives like rascals and we think already heaven is guaranteed for us. And the rest of us live in despair, thinking that the gates of heaven are already closed to us. So might as well be merry and party here. Hope looks away from man, from his technological progress, his human projects and achievements. But hope looks to the promise of God because God is at the core of hope and all other earthly hopes fail, they will fail us, but God never fails. Unfortunately, most people are busy putting their hope in all the wrong things, right? Consider those who have put their hope in their bank accounts, their stock portfolios, their retirement funds. Many have also lost hard-earned income and savings in get-rich-quick schemes. Others are hoping that the goodness within man will prevail and we will all live in peace and harmony. But you know, we still read about hatred and wars in our newspapers. People place hope in their elected leaders, sometimes treating them as if they were messiahs. Sadly, most political leaders are big on promises, short on delivery. On a personal level, some of you may be hoping for a better standard of life, which the job market hasn't provided. In fact, you may risk losing your job. Or maybe you've hoped for a new baby, but infertility has deflated this hope. It could be that you've, you've put your hope in good health until the doctor tells you and gives you your test results. Or maybe you're clinging to that hope that you will acquire the picture-perfect family. You marry the person whom you love, the love of your life. And after a few weeks, you, dis you discover she's Satan in disguise. In this world, we grasp for our version of hope. But God is holding out to us a whole different kind of hope. This is the kind of hope that will never spoil, it will never fade, and thieves can't break into it to steal it. Rust won't corrode it. It's a hope that endures. Our, la our Lord speaks of this transcendent hope in today's gospel passage. In the world, you will have trouble, but be brave. I have conquered the world. Strange words, I guess. In a world where little can be guaranteed, you know, our guarantees only last for two, three years. Or sometimes now they just last for one year. But the Lord guarantees us Christians, you will always have trouble. Spoken just a few hours before his arrest, Jesus' words would have been a baffling thing to the disciples to hear. Condemned as a criminal to be crucified on the cross, humiliated, Jesus did not look like someone who has conquered the world. In fact, his enemies, his enemies appeared to have conquered him. Faced with this, the apostles fled and went into hiding. They did not have the strength to face the passion and the death of Christ. But we all know how the story ends, right? Rather than being conquered by his enemies and being conquered by death, our Lord will emerge victor. He would conquer. He would conquer sin and death itself. So without the resurrection, there is no real hope, no real hope for salvation. It is this very hope that the world can't mess up, a hope that our financial crisis can't ruin, a 
hope that crime can't take away and a hope that the doctor's diagnosis can't touch. It is a hope that moves beyond this life and endures for eternity. So how can we bear this hope, bring this hope to the world that seems to have lost hope and have placed their hope in all the wrong things? How can we be witnesses of the hope of the resurrection, the hope of salvation in a world kept captive by the culture of death? The words of Jesus in today's gospel provides us with a clue. Simple words. Be brave. You know, if there is a statement that is most commonly repeated throughout Scripture, both in the Old and the New Testament, it must be these words. Be not afraid. Be brave. Our Lady at the Annunciation was also greeted by these words by the Archangel Gabriel. Do not be afraid. Be brave, Mary. So as bearers of hope like Mary, we must not allow fear to overcome us or cripple us. Rather, we must turn to the one who has conquered the world and all his fears. Fear makes us hide away. We hide away our crosses. We hide away the sign of the cross in public. We hide away our symbols and the very identity that we are Catholics. But the Lord tells us, be brave. He is the one who makes fear and anxiety themselves tremble with fear. He puts fear and death to flight. Our Lord is the one who has led captive fear in the victory procession. He has nailed it to the cross and committed it to oblivion. So the cross, never be ashamed of it. The cross is a sign that stands in judgment on all the false security, all the false hopes in our lives and restores faith in God alone. He alone is the Lord over fear. It knows Him as Master. It gives way to Him alone. Fear fears our Lord alone. So when you are afraid, look to Christ because fear is frightened of Him. Keep him before your eyes. Call upon him and pray to him. Believe that he is with you now, helping you. Then fear will grow pale and fade away and you will be free. You know, there's another alternative translation to the original Greek, which one translation is be brave. The alternative translation is quite interesting. It means to have good cheer, to be joyful. Courage must be matched with joy. How could we possibly be of good cheer when so many things seem to be going wrong with the world we live in? Well, the answer is found in seeing the connection between joy and truth. Joy isn't emotionally or intellectually dishonest. Joy isn't pretending everything is all right. But joy is born from holding to the truth that love wins, love will triumph. God conquers, Christ has conquered and overcome the world. It is the joy of experiencing the faithfulness of God, the pure delight in knowing that he loves us. Jesus tells us this, at the very moment that he's about to be betrayed, he says, I am not alone, for the Father is with me. No matter how bad things may seem, no matter how reality falls short, of our expectation, no matter how dark the situation may be, we are confident of the victory won by Jesus Christ. Our Christian joy is testimony to this joy, to this victory. In a world that has little cause for bravery or joy, Christians must be bearers of hope. We must be witnesses of hope. We must tell the world you are not alone. In our day and age, our Blessed Mother continues to be a beacon of hope in these dark times. You see before you here, not Our Lady of the Visitation, but Our Lady of Fatima. Remember, on the 13th of this month, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the first apparition of Our Lady in Fatima. 
A few months later, on the 13th of July, in another two months, we will celebrate the 100th anniversary of this so-called secret. Our Lady requested that Russia be consecrated to a Immaculate Heart, and she issued this cryptic but powerful promise. In a message that spoke of destruction, spoke of the power of communism over the world, spoke of how evil would seem to conquer us, she issued this promise. But in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. Those words uttered a century ago, a hundred years ago, offers the greatest hope for the world amid her warnings of sinfulness, chastisement and hell. They were an invitation to be brave. They were an invitation to trust in the promise of a son. Be brave. I have conquered the world. The promise of Our Lady would gradually be fulfilled in the months and years thereafter. You know, when Our Lady appeared, it was in the midst of World War I, which at that particular time was called the Great War because it killed millions, more people than all the different wars that had occurred in Europe or the rest of the world. World War I came to an abrupt end exactly 13 months after the final apparition of Our Lady of Fatima on October 13, 1917. Portugal was also under a regime that hated the church. The anti-clerical regime of the First Republic that deposed the king. It saw churches being plundered, convents attacked, religious congregations turned out of institutions, institutions being turned into even brothels, national church institutions and buildings nationalized, and the clergy harassed by strict restrictions. They were not allowed to celebrate the mass openly. They were not allowed to wear the clerical uh, dress, the cassock, but then within, within a year, a revival to its former religious fervor began. Part of it was because so many saw the miracle of the sun. But the age of communism, along with its militant atheism, would enslave much of the world and produce millions of martyrs. This would not come to an end until many, many decades later, until 1989. And again, it's significant. This happened five years after Pope St. John Paul II consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, as instructed by Our Lady. The Iron Curtain finally came crashing down, as prophesied by Our Lady. Our hope is not in vain. And so today, let us hold close to our hearts these twin promises of hope from Our Lady, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. And from our Lord, be brave, I have conquered the world. These promises give us a shining hope. They form two rays of light that penetrates the gathering clouds of darkness hovering over the earth. They remind us that we must never fall into desperation. We must never lose faith. We must never descend into fear and hopelessness, as have many others at the sight of the chaos, the confusion, the tribulations, and upheaval that continues to rock our world. We must always remain witnesses of hope by being brave and joyful. And when our energy seems spent, always remember, we can always turn to Our Lady, our Blessed Mother. She is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. And remember the beautiful prayer of St. Bernard of Claveau. If the winds of temptation arise, if you are driven upon the rocks of tribulation, look to the star, call on Mary. If you are tossed upon the waves of pride, of ambition, of envy, of rivalry, look to the star, call on Mary. Should anger or avarice or fleshly desire violently assail the frail vessel of your soul. Look at the star, call upon Mary. In dangers, in hardships, in every doubt, 
Think of Mary. Call out to Mary. Following her, you will never go astray. Asking her help, you will never despair. <laughs>